So have you guys ever walked underneath the streets of Paris and the catacombs down there? Yeah, there are sewer systems that have been converted into catacombs. And you can walk for kilometers and kilometers down there among the remains of five or six million dead people. And you can reach out and touch a skull that was once the precious possession, I guess, of a person just like you or me. And it seems like a very, very large number of people. And yet, it's a tiny drop in the bucket compared to the 100 billion people who've already died. And, and sometimes that just seems kind of senseless to me. And yet, not all death is senseless. Because if you, say if you go off to war and you die, well, duh, you know, it's kind of sort of expected. Um, or if you, um, if you choose your fun that happens to be highly risky and you die, well, come on, you had it coming. Um, but what if you choose your, your skydiving to be indoors? Specifically, you focus on, on managing that ratio of fun to risk. Still, you rot away from the inside of incurable degenerative diseases called aging and die despite your best efforts. That is more troubling to me. And people have been hard at work at this and are hard at work at this problem. It's called medicine. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's so far a dismal failure that if you, uh, if you were born before 1890, the chances of you being alive today, despite the best efforts of ever, everyone in the medical profession, is zero. And not just approximately zero or 0.00001% or something like that. It's, it's zero, mathematically zero. <sighs> uh, so basically, that means that um, there are essentially two alternatives that we have, all of us, I think at this point. One, I stole this from the internet. Um, like Ube, you could die unexpectedly, painlessly, instantly. You're gone. OK, that doesn't seem too bad, right? Unfortunately, this has been scientifically proven to produce the absolute worst outcomes for the people you leave behind for your loved ones and family. There's the highest rates of psychological trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder and various other nasty things. Um, OK, option two. You could die slowly, painfully, predictably of some degenerative, humiliating disease. That is the best for the people you love and leave behind. OK, so take your pick. Um, OK, really, are those the only alternatives? Um, in, in 1961, we set our collective sights in the US to putting a human being on the moon, which seemed impossible at the time, and eight years later achieved it. So that's pretty remarkable. It took a large collective effort of people working together for a common cause that mattered to them. You can bet that if a giant comet were discovered out there on a collision course with the Earth, such that it would destroy the Earth if it hit, people would mount a heroic effort and get out there and try to intercept and destroy that thing, deflect it as best we could. We would try. And indeed, people mount heroic efforts against more proximal health issues, survival for, for five years kind of mindset such as breast cancer. OK, so this suggests to me a third option. As Dylan Thomas so poignantly wrote to his dying father, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. Right? And why not? As biotechnology has been skyrocketing exponentially recently, it's become clear that 
biology is really a kind of technology, and that the, the problem of curing aging could be now considered an engineering problem, and thus ultimately within our grasp. Okay. But would that be such a good idea? What are the implications of that? Death is natural, right? It's a part of uh, the cycles and ecosystems on our planet. And if we upset that, maybe we would disturb the, the ecosystems and cycles on the planet in, in possibly unpleasant ways. And yet humans have always messed with nature. Uh, I don't need to do that right now. Go to super happy dev house? Hmm, that's kind of fun, actually. Wow. Technology is getting slightly better. Um, humans have always messed with nature. We build tools. That practically defines us. In fact, in, in case in point, when we see a child with an accelerated aging disease called progeria, who's, in this case, only seven years old, and the life expectancy is very short from that time forward, it's not natural, even though it is a naturally occurring genetic disease. We throw our collective and scientific might into trying to find a cure, at least some people do. Indeed, over the last couple hundred years, people working on medicine and medical technology have more than doubled human lifespan. And we look back on a time before antibiotics and think, how primitive. Like imagining a family standing around a, a sick person with you know, cholera or bubonic plague or typhoid and, and helplessly looking on while their loved one dies. Now, th these things are curable with antibiotics. We just take this for granted. Okay, zooming out and projecting forward into the future when life expectancies are longer, I predict that we will look back on today and think how primitive those poor people didn't have any anti-aging therapies. They're just rotting away from the inside of these processes that, were, that we understand now. And they had no ability to intervene in them, Alzheimer's and cardiovascular degeneration and so on. So OK, let's say we can do this. And let's say it's a good idea from some perspectives. What about the overall, our overall society? What about overpopulation? Would the Earth just fill up with billions and billions and billions of people and it becomes sort of a Mad Max hellhole? Here's a, a chart showing the, all the countries of our world as white dots. And on the vertical scale, we have fertility, which is the number of children born per woman, and on the horizontal GDP, which is a proxy for the degree of security and access to medical care and so on that each person in one of those societies has on average. At the least secure and highest fertility end is Niger in Africa, with almost eight women born, eight children born per women, woman. And in the center, we see the world average, just a tiny bit above the green line, which is the steady state replacement line, where population neither grows nor falls. And it's countries over here that pull this average just that little bit above the green line that ca has caused world population to grow so fast over the last few decades. At the other extreme, we have countries like Germany, <laughs> and approximately 1.5 children per woman. And, you know, some have zero, some have one, some have two, some have three. On average, it comes out to around 1.5. If all of the countries of the world had this level of security, then world population would be falling twice as fast as it's growing recently. And it would reach a new equilibrium at a much more sustainable population for the Earth. So clearly, overpopulation is more of a socioeconomic problem and not a medical problem. 
when I talk to my woman friends and ask them when they're planning on having a baby, the answer I get is not the teens and 20s that the one asking that question would have gotten in our historical past. Now, now I hear, oh, 30s or 40s. Basically, okay, when's my last chance? And I predict that as lifespans, both our total lifespan and our reproductive lifespans continue to increase, that women will continue to defer their childbearing years into later and later decades. And these are decades in which they will be feeling and looking younger. So I'm not talking about extending just lifespan. I'm not talking about people ending up in the, you know, the Greek myth of Tithonus, growing f f more and more frail and uh, decrepit with each passing decade, but still being alive. I'm not talking about the curse of the Strollbrugs and Gulliver's Travels, where they're continually decreasing in their mental and physical abilities. I'm talking about remaining youthful and healthy, increasing the healthy human lifespan such that people can continue to do whatever crazy things they want with their mind and body. There are a lot of aging theories. And many of them are simultaneously true. It's a complex, multifaceted problem. Dr. Aubrey de Grey of the SENS Foundation, a friend of mine, summarizes aging as simply metabolism, which is our, the normal bodily processes that occur, which accumulate damage over time. And when the damage gets to a certain threshold, then problems start occurring, pathology. And describes that the two groups of people working in aging as geriatricians and gerontologists. And the geriatricians are trying to slow the tide of this damage turning into pathology. It's where we spend most of our healthcare dollars. It can help a bit. The gerontologists are trying to prevent the damage from occurring in the first place based on this metabolism. But the metabolism is incredibly complex. Just this tiny subset of the metabolic pathways in just one cell is beyond our ability to reductionistically comprehend and predict the outcomes of. I believe that understanding, completely understanding metabolism and being able to sort of hack it, as I would like to say, in the startup community, um, be able to alter its functioning is a noble project for us to work on on the behalf of our children or our children's children, but is a difficult and long-term project. A third option is quite exciting that is emerging, which is that of just repairing the damages it occurs. A modern automobile is extremely complex, and you don't have to understand all of its complexity just to be able to change its oil which is about all you have to do to keep it alive for a very long time. Okay, so we sequenced the human genome, 2001, and biology since then has essentially become an information science. And thank you, for Seth, for introducing Moore's Law and the uh, exponential increase in information sciences. Biology has now hitched a ride on that exponential rocket of information technology. And this is a chart showing the, the uh, history of supercomputers. And you can see each horizontal line is 10 times more powerful than the last. And the progress has been very consistent. In fact, next year, the fastest supercomputer will surpass the raw computing power of a human brain. And Seth talked about how about seven years later, it's expected that the $1,000 home PC will surpass the computing power of a human brain. And so then that's the gap between $1,000 and you know, $100 million is about seven years. Um, this means 
that things are changing really fast now in biology. Indeed, this microfluidic laboratory on a chip is evocative of information technology and shares a lot of the, of the technologies that support it. So DNA microarray, just five years ago, one scientist in one afternoon in his laboratory, or her laboratory, um, as is especially the case in biology, fortunately, um, could do the number of experiments that would have taken about more than, say, 30,000 biologists in their laboratory that afternoon 15 years ago. And now that same biologist can do 4.2 million such experiments using a nimble gem chip. And of course, that's rapidly increasing. Meanwhile, nanotechnology continues on its somewhat parallel course. And gene therapy, recent successes in gene therapy suggest that the destiny that's written in our genes might be mutable. And lives are now being saved by regenerative medicine. Organs, new organs grown, being swapped into people and saving them from death. And this will only get better. The brain being an important last frontier in this. Okay, all mammals, us, dogs, mice, we all have an approximate same limit, an amount of breath that we can process, the amount of oxygen our bodies can process per unit body weight, and then we die. Except our friend, the naked mole rat, which somehow exceeds this threshold by a factor of 10. These things live over 30 years. So a, a few scientists are trying to figure out why and see if we could devise some kind of drug or some, in some way borrow from that ability. So what about, what about the other side? What about some benefits of us not dying so young? We have these great thinkers that develop in our, in our cultures. And just as they're starting to come of age, wisdom-wise, they get dementia and die off. And imagine a world in which our wisdom could continue to grow for hundreds of years. It's hard to even comprehend how wise people could get if their brains stayed clear and, and innovative and, and alive for that long. And many other benefits that I think you can use your imagination to, to see. Our generation, I think, has two choices. One, we can continue along, business as usual. Or two, we could focus our, our significant part of our collective energy on the biology of curing aging, an Apollo project for curing aging. Okay. So after that, we could do some new stuff, fun stuff. Or we could, and the e business, oh. Unfortunately, we're dead at that point, so. Um, and then here we can continue doing more fun stuff. There's a couple of choices for you. Um, of all the people in the world, only a very small number are working on this kind of work, this biology. And a, a larger number understand that it's an important thing to be doing, and an even larger number of people are getting an inkling that, that it's technologically possible. But eventually, I want all of us to recognize that, that we can collectively join this noble quest of altering the very human condition and be ultimately human in changing nature and building the ultimate tools. And imagine sustainability, environmental sustainability, in a time when people can expect to live all the way through to the time when the influences of their actions are realized. Imagine going to the wedding of your great-granddaughter and hearing her get up and say to her beloved, I love you forever. And for her to really mean that. Okay. Thank you.
So what do you think? <laughs> yeah. That's a meta question. <laughs> I, I love this noble cause of getting everyone together, but can't we all just focus on saving our planet so that we can actually live beyond on something and not find how to live on Mars and as our long lives? Absolutely. Um, fortunately, I. There's so many amazing thinkers in this project. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's a. Uh, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. And that I don't think that those two efforts are mutually exclusive. But some people have a passion for one and some people have a passion for another. Um, and also, they overlap. Um, and that if, you, if you're taking a long-term view um, and think, geez, I don't need to just run to work um, in my car and burn up as much fossil fuel as I can just to maybe make enough money to get a retirement so that I don't die poor in this X, short X number of decades, you're going to have a, a more expansive and, and um, sort of caring view about everything around you, in my opinion. If you, if, if there's something fundamentally selfish about striving to survive in the face of death, um, which you can do collectively, but what I notice, especially in this society, is actually done very um, individually. Um, or at best within clans. So, um, you know, I'm strongly in support of both of those. Um, they work in yeah. One. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's question? Yeah, it's a question and a comment. Oops. The, yeah. quest the question would be the best part for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> both. Uh, you know about the fact question that most of the civilizations, for example, Hinduism, has always thought about that life goes on. Mm -hmm. But it goes through this needle, what do you call it, needle hole or of so-called death. And most of it have uh, understood that's maybe the most important part of life. Okay. What do you think to that? So I, I think that... Um well, I personally um, don't adhere to a religion, um, but really I think that if you and I do, we really just, I just believe in one fewer God than you do. Excuse me, say I believe in one, only one fewer God than you do, perhaps, uh, which is I, I think that there are, there are a lot of re different religions out there, and many of them are mutually exclusive in their uh, belief systems with others. Some are convinced that there are multiple gods, some of them are absolutely convinced that there's only one God. Some are convinced that there's afterlives, other that you never die, um, this kind of thing. Um, so um, my concern specifically is with enabling people who would like to continue being healthy and, and living their lives to do so. And if other people would like to choose a time, their favorite time, to transition to whatever other world they imagine, then I would like to offer that to them as well. I guess uh, you could say I'm an extreme social liberal. <laughs> yeah, uh, Seth. I, I just sort of wonder, you know, the, the, what you see as the end point, or the, the, you know, how, how far are you willing to extend human lifespan? Is that indefinite? Because, you know, I don't hesitate to drive down to Safeway because the chances that I'm going to be killed in doing that are you know smaller than one in a million? Right. Okay. So I'm not I'm not an immortalist. Okay. Because you know if you live to thousands of years, you'll never you'll never leave your house. You just sit Absolutely. at home playing with the Wii no, no. all night. So, so so a fundamental a fundamental belief a sense of fairness that I have is that is that I would like to be able to choose my fun based on its risk level. So I'm more likely to go skydiving indoors than I am skydiving from a plane. But I'm much more likely to go skydiving from a plane than I am base jumping off a cliff. Um, but I do engage in risky sports. Um, you know, I, I go for helicopter rides. I, I, uh, um, I ride a mountain bike 
like way faster than I should, and it's really, really fun. And if you, if you cure aging, on average, people could be expected to live, say, two to 5,000 years, depending on, their, depending on the kinds of activities they engage in, and then die of something that they're enjoying. And, I, I drove here from Belmont today, and I knew that I had X amount of chance of dying, but I also really wanted to come here, and, I, and I, that's a bargain I'm, I'm willing to make. Um, but just sitting around and just like rotting away for nothing, eh, that just bugs the heck out of me, and I want to fix it. What do you think of cryonics as a stopgap? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Do, do any of you read XKCD? It's a comic strip um, that comes out every day. Oh, that's really funny. Um, but it's pretty hardcore geek humor, so I don't blame you. Um, uh, a recent, um, a recent comic that that showed someone saying, "Oh, I'm really curious about the future, so I'm going down into a cryonic preservation state, and uh, I, I can't wait to pop out 30 years later and find out what kind of new gadgets are are out. You know, gadget freak. So I went down, sealed them up. Time went by, popped it open, thawed him out. He woke up." rub the sand out of his eyes and, okay, it's 30 years later, so what kind of gadgets do we have? And they're like, I'm really sorry to tell you that, unfortunately, all the other techno freaks and gadget makers like you also went down into cryo 30 years ago. Um, but so they're all just waking up at the same time, and we have no new gadgets to show you. Oh, terrible. So, okay, put me to sleep again. Okay. Um, so the, the worst thing about cryonics right now is that it doesn't work, um, which is to say that, that uh, you're getting antsy, which means that we're probably done with the Q&A. Um, the chances of it working right now are just so ridiculously low that, that, um, that it kinda, it's kind of moot. Okay, but maybe what you're asking instead is, what if cryonics worked? Um, what, it, 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 is, that a, is that a reasonable option? And I would say, yeah, I, I'd say, sure, um, that's, like, to my socioeconomic point earlier, you know, overpopulation is a socioeconomic problem. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's, you, if you want to have a giant replica of, of a 19th century steam engine perfectly painted, functioning in your living room just because you think it's the coolest thing ever, you can do that if you're really wealthy. And cryonics is also a luxury of the wealthy. So if you got the money and you don't mind the odds, then then go ahead and do it. But you know, you're consuming resources that aren't, aren't then available to other people. So, but, you know. so do we all, living this opulent first world lifestyle that we're enjoying at this very moment. Yeah. So. Woohoo! <laughs> I like it. Thank you very much, Joel. Oh, my pleasure.